What is going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer from blueandgold.com, and with me is none other than Mike Goolsby. And of course, this is the Mike Goolsby show, so I feel like you got to have him on here. So uh, we had to uh, delay a day from our normal Sunday night live show, um, but here we are on a Monday. Appreciate you guys joining us live. If you're watching back, um, appreciate you as well. Make sure um, you hit that thumbs up. Goolsby and I have a few topics to discuss um, before we get into questions later in the show. Uh, but if you want your question answered right away, uh, drop a super chat. We will take that right away. Daniel Wade already dropping us a 20 spot. Um, so appreciate Coming that hot, a ton. Daniel. Um, Daniel, if you have a question for us, uh, make sure you, you drop it. And we'll, we'll get to that um, right away. So, all right. Those housekeeping items out of the way. Mike, Notre Dame. Yeah, hit that thumbs up. People appreciate the future. Um, hit, hit a thumbs up for us. Uh, Mike, 31-16 win for the Fighting Irish over USC. Still a one-loss team. Covered the spread by a touchdown. So, you know, good in that aspect for those people who who bet that. Um, not sure if you did, Mike. but um, I did. I did. So thoughts. Yeah, thoughts on the win. Um. I read maybe it was this morning, but I read that this is the largest margin of largest margin of victory for Notre Dame versus USD in some 20 years. So that's impressive. But watching the game and then on the rewatch, Mike, I wasn't disappointed, but I was underwhelmed. And then when you look at the the stat line, the the team stats, uh, you could argue Southern Cal had a better game than we did, and we came away with the win. But it's a little bit of an underwhelming performance. Yeah, I'm a defensive guy, Mike. Um, a lot of bending but don't break is kind of what we saw out there Saturday, some poor tackling. Um, and this is, again, Mike, coming from a, a guy who, uh, when I played at Notre Dame, you know, USC was up, and we were up and down throughout those, those years. But twice... USC basically won their quarterbacks Heisman trophies on a national stage night games against the Irish. First was Carson Palmer. Then it was Matt Leinart. And um, they basically, they being Pete Carroll and staff did what it took to kind of lock up a Heisman trophy for their quarterbacks. Um, and I felt like in this game against SC, we could have maybe ran it up a little bit more, been a little bit more dominant or a little bit in, more emphatic in, in the, the style or the fashion in which we won. So it's just a, a little bit underwhelming. USC is not a great team this year. They have an interim coach, um, just like they've stuck it to us in the past as a traditional rivalry. I think we might have missed a little bit of an opportunity to, to stick it to them this time around. The 2019 game, Notre Dame was up big. This one, they were up 24 to 3 both times. Um, you know, they let USC back in the game late. The difference in this game and the 2019 game was Notre Dame had that final touchdown to make it at least um, a double digit point game. I believe 2019 game was what 33 27 or something like that. And then, of course, they didn't play um, last year. So, um, again, appreciate everyone uh, joining us live here. Um, let's stay here with the defense. What did they do well? What didn't they do well? Uh, I mean, they didn't allow a touchdown until the fourth quarter. Yeah, that's what they did well. Um, but throughout the course of the day, and I don't know how, how into the X's and O's we'll get on this tonight, Mike, but it's just there was the, the tackling was pretty poor. Maybe that's to be a, a little bit expected coming out of a, a bye week. You might be a, just a tinge rusty. But, uh, yeah, it's just kind of like they were a little leaky, giving up short passes, giving up small runs throughout the course of the day. But, like, uh, USC kind of had one too many just prolonged drives. We did get one turnover, but we gave one up. Uh, maybe, excuse me, two turnovers. Um, I'm talking interceptions here. I wasn't blown away by the defense. Schematically, Mike, I put a lot of, like, thought into this. It's like I've yet to break out my own whiteboard, but – some of the stuff we do schematically on defense, um, I just cannot get my head around it, and I don't understand it. And the Foskey playing in the box is, is the obvious one. We gave up a fourth and two. Um, later in the game, we gave up a fourth and two. 
in whatever defense we were in, we had Jack Kaiser and we had a corner number 11 playing as inside linebackers. And it's just like, I've used the term cute. I think that sometimes we're getting a little bit too cute on defense. You have a historically, I'm going to stop myself before I get into the rant here, Mike, but I think like historically we Isaiah Fossey is going to have a historic season. You know, I pulled up some recent high end defensive end draft picks and like Rashawn Gary out of uh, Michigan. You've got a kid at Michigan this year, Aiden Hutchinson, who's playing himself into the first round. Kayvon Thibodeau, the stud defensive end from Oregon. So right now Isaiah has more sacks than both of them, double what um, Thibodeau has. And Isaiah is not even allowed to play full-time defensive end. And he's putting up that type of production. But, you know, the only guy like notable in the last – several handful of years that's had more sacks is Chase Young, who had, I think, 16 and a half. But Isaiah Foskey is a top five, top 10 NFL type pick based off of ability, how he is projected to test, and then the production on the field. And uh, I'm just tired of the three-man front with leaving him in a box. I didn't feel like we did a lot defensively to help out our field corner and Clarence Lewis. I don't know why for one game or for a a series or two, you can swap Cam Hart um, and Clarence Lewis. I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. Um, So yeah, it was just kind of a, kind of a mushy performance for me on defense. And then you, you tie that in with the poor tackling and just really kind of dragging people down. You didn't see a lot of big hits save for JD on that quarterback, which was sort of an obvious penalty, but you love to see that against a USC quarterback either way. Um, so I, my hope Mike, to kind of wrap up that defensive thought, my hope in the last time we talked, bud, was I was hoping that coach Freeman and staff would do a little bit of self scouting and maybe trim some fat from the defensive playbook and just really, okay, these are the schemes and this is the, the unit and the personnel groups that we're going to run with going forward. And it doesn't seem like that was the case defensively speaking, we're still yeah, interchanging parts and moving around schemes. And a lot of times, man, it just doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. Again, appreciate everyone with us live. And also thank you, Bolton Landing Brewing Co. Uh, a couple weeks Oh, yeah. Ago. Hey, Mike, cheers. Yeah, cheers, cheers my buddy. brother. Yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were um, uh, drinking on the show. And uh, then I got an email and said, <laughs> hey, can we send you some beer? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's beer. That's free beer. Are you kidding me? You wouldn't take that. So as you've said, as you've said many a time, Mike, you said we're easily bought, right? Very easily bought. Heck, yeah. Beer, super chats, whatever. Send them our way. Uh, we're just a couple guys talking Notre Dame football, and I uh, appreciate everyone joining us. So we are eight minutes and 20 seconds into the live show and haven't dove into the quarterback play yet. So. Uh, Mike, why don't we do that? What do you think? Let's start with Jack Home. What do you think about um, his performance on the day? His stat line: twenty of twenty-eight, hundred eighty-nine yards, touchdown, and an interception, which I felt like should have been a reception. Here's the one interesting thing: I remember seeing an over/under for Cone's uh, yardage at a, set at one hundred ninety. Vegas is crazy, <laughs> crazy good, and he ended at one hundred eighty-nine. So, I digress. Uh, what do you think about Cone? I go back to my general thought for the entire game is just a little, it's a little underwhelming. Um, We, we came in with some tempo. We ran tempo on offense throughout, which serves Jack Cohn. Well, the offensive line played well, but you have to put an asterisk next to the offensive line play in that USC predominantly was in a three man front, which helps our, obviously our line block better. That being said, we did give up a sack on a three-man rush. Kane Madden was out to lunch. But, the, only uh, the, the only one of the game, I'll add. Yeah, the only one of the game. But again, when it's three on five for the majority of the game, I like our odds, any team's odds. So Cone, we, we got the tempo. We got some, some rhythm going. A lot of short throws. Uh, you know, look at the stat line. You threw the ball almost 30 times a game, and you had under 200 yards passing. Like, I, I'm not – thrilled in this one one passing touchdown one interception which you know should have been a touchdown ball could have been placed slightly different I think I think he underthrew mayor 
I think he underthrew Lorenzo Crawford. And these are our, and those are like the deep shots that we took. And I know how difficult it is to complete, but I'm not going to be a Jack Cohen apologist. And I do, I support our, our quarterback, but I, I still think that Tyler might have just flat out more arm talent. Now, this is like a big picture thing, Mike. But depending on how how the season plays out and what happens outside of Notre Dame football with the rest of college, you know, college football world, like we could mess around and end up surely in a New Year's Six game, potentially in the playoff. And if you go into that playoff with Jack Cohn or even in a New Year's Six game against a, a marquee premier college football program, I don't like our odds as much as I do with Tyler Buckner because if we can't complete those big chunk plays, those deep balls to Styles, those deep balls to Mayer, uh, the deep ball to Austin, like we're going to lose. Um, and that's that's the, the way that we lose those games is against big play explosive type teams. And we still are missing that element from our offense. Um, and like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be grinning. Like I'm not going to, I'm not gushing over the fact that we threw the ball almost 30 times a game and threw for under 200 yards. I'm just not. So I, I'm a little bit, I'm not, I'm not impressed by Cone. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see him be a good custodian of the football and through the one random kind of pick this last week. But I'm talking about if the team and the program wants to be great, Mike, and win those big time matchups against big time programs, you need more out of that position. Yeah. I mean, that's what we talked about last year with book and you love book. Yeah. But still, I mean, it's, yeah, you need a superstar right now at the quarterback position, unless you have superstars all around them, truck trailer going back to, um, you know, our favorite, yes. our favorite thing there. So you think Buckner has more arm talent than mm-hmm. Cone. So you think mm-hmm. Buckner should be playing right now. That's, that's your kind of, Here's what I'm trying to say, and this is what a, what a fascinating, fascinating subject matter, Mike. But what I'm arguing is, like, you were look at this week. So Michigan plays Michigan State, so we move up a couple spots. Like, we're going to be in that top six, and who knows that top four position. And if unless Buckner continues to develop kind of incrementally, Mike, we will lose that game because you don't have a big time player at that position is what I'm trying to say. So should Buckner be playing more? Yes. Should Buckner be the guy right now? Probably not. But throwing him in for two passes isn't going to serve us well, like big picture, like in totality this season. So that's hopefully a makes sense, Mike. Yeah. I, I just, you let him, let him throw the ball more. And yes, you put on the tape. Drew Pine's got a better arm than Cohen. And I think that Buckner has as quick of a release as Pine. I think he's just a, a more natural thrower of the ball um, in, in, you know, like that, the first deep ball to, to styles, like that is a touchdown. You take the top off the of defense and all of us would be jumping off of our couches at home. We just, we don't get to see it and you're, you're that close to being able to see it, but it's going to take continued development with Tyler. Yeah. You talked about the, the teams ahead of Notre Dame, likely beating each other up. I mean, Ole Miss, that's, I mean, you look at, so, Notre Dame's at 11. See, and this is the AP mm-hmm. poll, by the way. There's no guarantee that the college football playoff rankings are going to be the same as this when these when those come out. But you got Ole Miss ahead of Notre Dame. You got to think they'll lose again this season. Iowa, very. I mean, Iowa, Michigan State beat each other up. Oregon, you know, well, or, Oregon will probably lose. Oregon's not that good. I've, I've one of my kids that I train is at Oregon, so I watch their games. Oregon's not that great. Avante Dickerson, right? Yeah. yeah, Avante. Yeah. Yeah, so apparently he's going to start playing a little bit too in terms of cool. live snaps, not just special teams. So anyways, yes, Avante's over there, so I watch. So, I mean, we're better. I mean, we're – I would say we're better than Michigan State. We're better than Iowa. It's just top-end talent. But so if you go into those big-time games and you have to play in Ohio State, you have to play in Alabama, you have to play in Oklahoma, and just think explosive plays, et cetera um, – you know, we're bringing a knife to a gunfight unless you have a comp- quarterback that can make so make those type of throws. I mean, Michigan will lose to Ohio State. Um, doesn't you don't need much analysis there other than it's just Michigan playing Ohio State. Ohio State might run the table. Oklahoma, 
I mean, probably got to have a pretty good chance to run the table. Maybe Oklahoma State trips them up. Alabama, I think they'll run the table. Cincinnati, and then you look at Cincinnati as the number two spot, Mike. It's no, crazy. I mean, you, you, th- you think back to that game, which was kind of just so lethargic for the Irish in the first half. Like, what? Like, was Cincinnati really that much better than Notre Dame? Like, no. The offense just stunk it up. Um, defense, you know, at, at a couple bad drives. And I think Notre Dame's better than Cincinnati. It's like, man, if you put that last year's team, you know, 2020 into 2021, I mean, yeah. I think Notre Dame's, you know, second or third best team in the country. Um, but it's so, a down year. Which is, which is. It's a weird year, and I know, Mike, you and I touched on this specifically, the fact that it is such a down year and there's a lot of turnover. As we're talking about the quarterback position, right, there's a lot of turnover at that position at these marquee top-tier type programs. And it was like, what an interesting window for of all years for Notre Dame to sneak into that, competi- uh, that, that conversation if you had the right player at that position. And again, Jack Cohn played fine against the – uh, it's almost like as I was watching the game, especially the second time back, SC was playing so many three-man fronts on defense. It was almost like the game plan for Tyler as opposed to to Jack. Like it was just they were flooding passing lanes. Like you're going to try and make Tyler throw into crowded windows, and if you're playing Jack, you're going to try and heat him up with a four-man front, right? That'd be your generic approach. So I, I'm still asking for continued development of Tyler. Disappointed to see him only take, you know, make have two pass attempts coming out of a bye week too. So that was, it's just the whole, the whole situation is it's 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 uh, mind numbing to like watch this unfold, this whole experiment, and poor Drew Pines back there on the bench. And eh, I don't know. You can see I can see one thing so clearly with Tyler, and see another thing so clearly with Jack, but I'm not you know, the one making the decision. But I just think if you end up in one of those marquee matchups at the end of the year and you don't have a player like Tyler in the game and you're playing first round town at defensive line in front of you, it could get ugly. <laughs> Cause there's like, we stalled down there in the end zone of the first couple drives. And then it seemed like they sprinkled in Tyler with that little quarterback power. As the game progressed, we p- performed a little bit better in the red zone. There's just plays that you see kind of, we ran a, we had Jack under center on one play and he ran a bootleg uh, zone boot and he tried to roll out to his right physically can't do it and it's like Tyler that'd be perfect for Tyler to, to draw up especially as as much 12 per, per personnel as we're going to play and we've got uh, the backup tackle not all the other one um, playing you know he's wearing number 45 now as our third tight end like we're, if we're going to play so much out of that base as our base package you put Lindsay at one wide receiver you put Styles at the other zone boot and just throw deep balls and if it's not there, Tyler can scoot. So I always ask you this when when we're talking about the quarterbacks is, oh, well, I mean, what what are you supplanting? Um, you know, Conan putting in Buckner as the, the QB one right now. Is it more of swapping drives or fit, like what what would you do if it was your call? Yeah, it'd probably be it'd probably be a swapping of a drive. It. You think that's again, good for like, not... a locker room and. I don't. Th- I think the team responds better. I've said that on record. I think the t- the team, the wide the wide receivers in general, in particular, play up when Drew Pine is in the game, or Tyler's in the game. I think it's because again, Jack isn't hasn't been there for the previous two, three, four years. Right? He's a he's a free agent signee. So it's like I don't think that that's going to have an adverse effect in the locker room. I just don't. And players see what they see. I mean, so, yeah, I think maybe you do it on a series-by-series series basis or you take advantage of that bye week um, and you get Tyler more caught up and you give him more opportunities. It's just Coach Kelly's like a conservative dude. He's a conservative guy. He's very risk-averse, and it, that's pretty apparent. So he's like, if I can go in there and beat SC by 10 points, I'm going to beat SC by 10 points. He does, You know, it's just – and get out of there with a win. The, the 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 overall approach to the game was just very kind of business business like, right? There wasn't a lot of splash plays. It was just yeah, it wasn't a pedestrian effort, but it uh, there's good play, good good game plan by Coach Reese, but 
I thought they could have done more to be more demonstrative and be a little bit more dominant coming out of there. Yeah, you mentioned bye week. Notre Dame already had that. No more bye weeks um, this season, if I if I heard you correct, Mike. Um, yeah, no, I was just I was just saying you're gonna at, coming out of the bye, but prior to this week, you you would have expected there be to be more packages for Tyler than there wasn't. This is kind of it seems like a swing and a missed opportunity. So I, I hear you, Mike, but I just go like you're saying Buckner, you know, if you, if you play a team like Alabama and a playoff or playoff game or bowl game or whatever, you'd rather have Buckner back there than Cone. Yes. I don't know, man. I mean, a true freshman who is he at a point right now where he's going to, you know, uh, juke out NFL defensive linemen and, and pick up 20 yards through the air or on the ground, like – I still just don't think Buckner is the answer right now. I think that's okay. That's why we're here, buddy. Yeah, I, I think you know. I mean, well, play, I can tell you, you, you don't, you don't know if you don't know if Tyler would have the ability to do that. But we do know that Jack doesn't. Right. I don't Jack, think. Jack I mean, how many quarterbacks? There, there's not many that you can put on this team that would make that big of a difference right now. Like, especially not on Notre Dame's team. I don't think any of these quarterbacks can. Like, I don't think it's a uh, an indictment on Cone. It, it's just this is the situation. Like, just Notre Dame's just not in a place where it can beat Alabama. I mean, it, and you know how many programs wow, out there wow. that can't beat Notre Dame? I mean, <laughs> it's there's a lot. So it's just yeah. Well, you know, I, like we said a few weeks ago, I don't like to waffle. I try and think about what I'm going to say and then try and say it. And I always support our quarterback. And if we're going to go with Jack, I'll support it, right? Because it's my alma mater and I support the quarterback. I'm just telling you that in those those crazy big-time games, like you need big-time splash plays. And Tyler what can provide those um, – more than Jack can. I mean, Jack is on a script and he's, again, it's, it's conservative. And that's why I think all those years that Ian book was our quarterback and gosh, darn it, he wouldn't pull the trigger on, on so many of those obvious throws, but he didn't turn the ball over. So coach Kelly can live with that versus like, yeah, Tyler, Tyler might run for 85 yards and throw for three fifty, but turn the ball over twice. And it's like, sometimes you got to let kids take their lumps. So I just want to see more involvement from Tyler uh, in a typical offense. You know, obviously he's going to do more of the RPO thing, but uh, I'm not for the gadget play, obvious quarterback run type deals. I'm not. Let him run, let him play the position. Sure, which is what they did during against Virginia Tech, and you know, for the most part, worked out. But they certainly needed yeah. to to win that game. All right. We are going to touch on one more topic that we're going to get straight into questions. So make sure you guys hit that thumbs up. If you want your question answered right away, uh, drop super chat. Go ahead and post your questions now. We'll get to them after this um, segment that we'll get to now. Three standout players um, that you know you told me you wanted to touch on. I'll name them. You tell me what you thought about them. Start with Kyron Williams, 25 rushing attempts, 138 yards. Took it to the house twice. Also caught six passes for 42 yards. That's 31 touches. That's, you know, getting the football a lot. Kyron Williams, heart and soul of this football team, Mike. Oh, unquestionably so. Uh, aside from Michael Mayer, Kyron's the only guy that you consistently, Mike, if ever, dude, do anything extra in terms of, like, what, what I've asked kind of or, or pleaded for from uh, Kevin Austin, like, dude, just do like 10, try 10% harder. Uh, Kyron, Kyron Williams is, uh, his, dude, his balance, and there, that's two weeks in a row I've seen him like step out of certain tackles. He was hitting the spin button quite a bit this week against USC. Um, I'm excited to see where he eventually lands in the NFL and how a team plans to kind of use him because he's kind of like that Austin Eckler. I mean, he's wound so tight. Um, and it's, it's just so funny. I mean, I saw a clip where this week prior to the fourth quarter, they did the whole light show with the Kanye West song, which is awesome, right? I love that stuff, especially on a big recruiting weekend. And they're kind of showing the the sideline, kind of filming down our, our sideline. And Kyron's out there dancing. Meanwhile, he's already had, you know, 20-something touches. Um, 
the guy's a tremendous, tremendous player. Uh, I've become a bigger fan of him this year than I was last year. He's a really special player. And a lot of these yards, folks, that he's making, he's making them on his own. It's just a little bit of magic back there. Really, really special player. Stud. Notre Dame would be yeah, extremely lucky if he would stay another year, but NFL will be We need to him. talk about that. Okay. We need you want to talk about, about it now? That. Well, let's go through the other couple guys. Lorenzo Styles, kind of his coming out part yeah. of it. Three receptions, 57 yards on four targets. Had that 29-yard run up the left sideline. Uh, a little catch and run there in the flats. Um, talk about Styles. Um, the kid looks looks the part. He's kind of as, as advertised. Um, it's really fun to watch these young kids, Mike, when like when they get the ball in their hands. They almost, there's a little bit of that freak out factor where they're just trying to go 100 miles an hour. And like you've seen with Kyron, as Kyron's become better and more and more confident, um, he's wearing that C on his chest. Like he'll he'll let his ability kind of take over and he'll do a little bit extra, right? Whereas, and I, it's going to be exciting to see Lorenzo develop and start throwing a little bit of shake or a little bit of wiggle into some of his um, like yards after a catch type scenario. But he's a burner. Um, again, we missed him on a on a deep ball. And I'll say this too: like I was thinking, like Kevin Austin, uh, like he's an NFL dude, right? And if anybody knows Kevin Austin, like this is I want this to be a hundred percent positive. Like he's playing himself like out of potential future opportunities like with the NFL, like you've been gifted with this length and the speed and this body, like you got to start to do more. Like you have to, um, like some of those jump balls, like receivers would, would kill for an opportunity to go make a play like that. Like it's time to start doing it. You know, um, there's nothing worse than wasted potential. And I see that with Austin and Lorenzo styles, a guy like that, you can, if he goes out there and, and continues to play the way that he did, he'll pass him off. So we just need to find, whether it, it, it always comes back to the quarterback, Mike, but if it's Tyler Buckner gives us the opportunity to make some of those big splash plays, we got to find somebody for the, him to catch those types of balls. And if it's Lindsay and styles versus Lindsay and, and Austin, so be it. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about him to get to see him play. And, and even Colsey played well, had a nice catch on a third down. Yep. We missed him up the seam once earlier, but uh, both players look the part. Like I like, the way they're put together, the way they kind of move around. So, yeah, very exciting stuff. And then Foskey was the last one. And yep. we t- we touched on him a little bit earlier. But, Mike, yeah, he is a uh, – and you kind of saw it a little bit last year. At least I did. Like, And I, it's – when you put on the – like when you tune on the NFL, when you turn on, tune in and watch an NFL game, like players look a certain way. Like they have a certain build. Um and like I, I, Isaiah Foskey checks so many of those boxes in terms of just like the bendability, the strength, the length. Uh, to me, he reminds me a lot of OCU Manuro for any of our Giants fans out there. Uh, that's sort of my comp for him. And he's having a historic year. I played with Justin Tuck, who everybody likes to kind of tout as uh, obviously comparison with Isaiah. But he's a special talent. I hope he comes back. Um, but the production, eight sacks and a limited amount of snaps with our rotation at defensive line. And then with all of his snaps as an inside linebacker, I mean, he might have 10, 11, 12 at this point. Yep. Darn good group there. Uh, we had a comment earlier about Bo Bauer. Uh, we want to touch on his interception. Um, mm-hmm. good to see your, one, one of your linebackers, you know, almost, almost score touchdown there, but. Keaton Slovis tackles Bauer, then Notre Dame kicks a field goal. Um, they got real conservative. You would have liked to see Buckner um, maybe go in there. I hated that series. I but hated that series. I know you hated that, but before you talk about how you hated it, tell us about Bauer. You know, pretty excited to see a linebacker make that play? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I've been pretty vocal about my thoughts on Drew White's play, and I and I understand him as a player, but – Bauer to me again the size the movement ability he's quicker he's longer so that was really fun to watch him uh get some some time in the spotlight there and he looked he looked great on the return uh he had some wheels and there's another thing I'll just point out about um about Bo 
there was twice where we watched our linebackers get beat up the seam that game, like where a tight end kind of out jumped them. JD Bertrand got a ball caught over his head and uh, they tried to throw a similar route against Bo and Bo being six, three, six, four with a little bit of reach. The, they completed the ball against a six, one JD Bertrand and they didn't complete the ball against a six, three, six, four Bauer. So like, again, it goes back to that conversation kind of about NFL athletes, what they sort of look like. Bauer is a much on paper, he looks much more impressive body type wise than, than Drew. And um, give me more Bo Bauer as far okay. as I'm concerned. Okay. All right. Let's get into some question time, Mike. Um, let's see. I will take one. Mike, I've gotten, I've gotten good at changing these earbuds, dude. Yeah, I'm not losing you out. or <laughs> that's happened to us. Uh, Kai asks about Anthony Lucas, a uh, 2022 defensive line target for Notre Dame. Make sure you guys watch. Uh, we, uh, uh, Greg Ladke and I posted a, a YouTube video today talking about three big Notre Dame recruits who were on campus this weekend. We did not touch on Lucas, um, certainly could have, but there's so many guys we didn't want a long video. Um, so make sure you watch that. As far as Lucas goes, um, article on him at blueandgold.com and mentioned him in the gold standard this morning. Um, so make sure you check that out again, blueandgold.com. Um, Eric asked kind of about the... I don't know, for the lack of a better term, odd man out, Drew Pine. Um, he says, I'm sure it's enough with two quarterbacks rotating, but will we? Will Drew Pine see the field again? Um, Mike, I don't know if you have a crystal ball to answer that question, but w- what are kind of your thoughts on Drew Pine? Would you like to see him more in there? If not, uh, or, or if so, <laughs> then what? Three quarterbacks? Two? Could you replace him with, uh, replace Cone for Pine? What do you think? These are the fun what ifs. So when I read that question, Eric, my tongue in cheek response, I wanted to say, you may see him on the field, but maybe not in a Notre Dame uniform because it's, it's there. I mean, there's the potential he could transfer out. Oh, I mean, he's yeah. kind of had his chain. He said his chain jerked around a couple times and who could blame him. If Cone were to get nicked up or sprain an ankle or sprain a knee or something like that, I would imagine you'd probably see Drew Pine as your starter uh, and maybe step more into Jack's role, I would assume. Mm. I don't know if you're going to go out there with Tyler full time just because I don't under, I don't believe he's got a full grasp of the playbook at this point. No, but or Virginia Tech, Mike. Virginia Tech when Cone – was ineffective, they didn't go to Pine. And that was the week after the Cincinnati game. And then Well, the- I said I said, to be clear, because <laughs> you know, the message board, I said if Cone gets hurt, you might see Pine. Okay. Okay. So if he's if he's ineffective, that's one thing. Um, what, what well what's the difference there in your opinion between why Pine might play instead of Buckner for um, ineffective versus injury? So if you go with the first scenario where Cone gets hurt, right? So he's going to miss, shoot, for the sake of the argument, he's going to miss the rest of the year. I think you would leave Pine in as your majority of the time player slash starter because he has a better grip of the playbook. And then, you, but with that, you would probably see more of a Tyler package. Um, but if Cone was ineffective, it seems like we always like, we always need that spark. Right. So then, yeah, it would probably be more Tyler, but then maybe you let Cone cool off or, or reset himself and you bring him back in. I, Mike, I wish I knew what was going on, dude, like at the position. I, you know, I don't know how they, it seemed like this year or this year, like it was, it was pretty obvious. Jack kind of knew when Tyler was coming in and out, like it seemed like it wasn't as random as maybe weeks prior. Um, but no, I don't see, uh, I don't see Pine probably playing unless he's needed in more than likely in like a injury type scenario. That's my best guess. Oh, makes sense. Appreciate everyone watching with us live. Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up big group with us again. Uh, drop your questions for Mike Goolsby. Um, if you want to guarantee your question gets answered, drop super chat. Uh, we are very easily bought. This was a comment a little bit earlier. I always love when people address us as Mike. Um, assuming that they're talking, they're talking to you there, bro. They're, they're I know they're talking to me, 
Um, but uh, I, always, I always chuckle when we get comments on YouTube. I'm like, I don't know <laughs> which mic you're talking about here. Uh, Paul says, come on, Mike, a QB can, who can scramble gives you a plus. Yes, obviously. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, not all uh, great quarterbacks are, you know, dual threat guys. I mean, also a quarterback who throws the ball best down the field gives you a plus, And I think Cohn is um, better at that than, than Tyler Buckner right now. Well, oh, Mike, so hang on. Okay. But what is that based off of? What is that? And you already said like two weeks ago, we got the tape. Don't forget. Uh, you what were like, oh, obviously. You were like, obviously. I think you said, and I'm going to, and I quote, obviously Cohn's not the guy. For what? Not the guy for what? Uh, to like be, to win a national championship? Because I said that on this show. No, to to as as to be our quarterback. Whatever game it was, he had a stinker of a performance, and you were like, "All right, obviously he's not the guy." I'll find it. I'll text it to you. Later. It was, it, 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 so, but you're so forget about that. I don't forget like the waffle. You said, like you. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm gonna start calling you Ego, bro. I think. Uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, so what when you're talking about? Cone has a better deep ball. You no, feel I, like I think he's a better point. throw of the football right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I covered based Buckner. off of like based off of data, based off of you've seen it. I saw Buckner as a recruit and the, his Elite Eleven performance in, in twenty twenty just kind of burned into my brain. It was not it was not very good. It, there were some good moments, hmm. but that, that's kind of burned into my brain. Um I, I lean a little bit on the coaches. That they're starting comb for a reason. Is it? Does it go back to your comment about Kelly's just very conservative and he's going to do things, you know, the way he wants to and kind of be rigid in that and and not want to change? Maybe, maybe that's part of it. But I I lean a little bit towards the coaches and I don't know. I just haven't been super impressed with with Buckner throwing the football down the field this season. He did his two passes, uh, especially the 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 one over the middle to Mayor. It was a really nice ball. But yeah, I just I don't think he's. I don't think he's a better thrower of the football right now. The but coach. didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he throw a perfect ball? Yeah, he's. But the times that they've let him throw, I, we've seen more under throws, and we saw Tyler float a couple balls against Virginia Tech. No, I'll blame that on adrenaline. And the only way to kind of bring him back down is to let him get reps, live reps, so he gets more accustomed to sort of dealing with all of that sort of stress. Um, but Tyler's a better deep ball thrower. That'll pull, that'll prove itself out. I mean, we saw we saw Cohen dude underthrow three balls today. Ty, Lorenzo Styles is a touchdown. It's underthrown. He doesn't like I said. He's he doesn't have the strength. So I think he either has he doesn't have the natural arm strength. So he either has to like overdo it and lose some accuracy. You'll see. And Tyler's Tyler's got the best arm, and he's a much more fluid thrower. Much more okay. fluid. Uh, Joseph Seth, Mike, if you were Bo's teammate, how much, um, how much crap would you give him? How much stuff, how much crap would you give him for getting tackled by the quarterback? Well, I'll tell you this much, Joseph. I had, uh, infamously, I had an interception for a touchdown on the road at Tennessee one time. Infamously. And, and I, dude, I had, uh, well, whatever the usage of the word is. I had like, uh, whatever it was, 20 something yards. I ran Mike and, uh, I needed like oxygen. You know, I needed a, I needed a nap, you know, <laughs> just from running 20 yards. So for that, for Bo to run 70 yards and get hawked down, you know, I blame his teammates for not finding a block more than I find him. That's a long way for us to go with the ball, especially right. with, I'd love to know you. Yeah, we all know what an adrenaline dump is. Like, I just wonder what that adrenaline dump was, was like for Bo after that. Maybe he needed a series to rest up. Jamie asked kind of uh, along these lines, would you say our linebackers have average speed, not great speed, and that this group needs to be more rangy next year? Um, that's a good question. Let me stare at that question here. Do they have average speed? I would say they probably have a little bit above average speed. And then there's like time speed. We all know this. There's time speed and there's play speed. Like JV, JD Bertrand has great play speed and he just – he has a motor – and uh, he just gets to the ball. Um, my problem with Drew White, like you use the term rangy, my problem with Drew White, you'll go back and watch the film. There's so many times where he goes at people to tackle them and his arms just aren't long enough to like envelop the, the ball carrier. Uh, Marist, like if you had Marist and you had Bauer playing as your linebackers, 
you know, your two inside ish linebackers at Mike and Will, that that'd be two special athlete kind of body types at that at that position. Um, and then like in the future, yes, if we roll in a Jalen Sneed and players like that, um, that's what you're looking for across the board, whether it be folks like look at look at the defensive roster here. Kyle Hamilton, 6'4, 220, long as hell, like 6'10 wingspan, whatever. Cam Hart is probably an NFL corner, same body type, just not as tall. Isaiah Foskey, super long. Like Marist, super long. Jalen Sneed, super long. That's what we're looking for, uh, you know, generically speaking. So the more of those types of bodies, the better. And then coach them up. And if you get the effort, then that's what, you know, national championship teams defensive kind of defenses kind of look like nowadays okay had a uh, question let me pop up real quick um do you think brian kelly slash tommy reese are too conservative um talk about their play calling tommy had a great game plan this week and there was times where you know coming off of bo's bo's pick and we go run run in completion inside the red zone that's conservative maybe Coach Reese was caught off guard. You see that a lot in high school football, Mike, where there'll be an interception in the next play on offense is like a fullback dive just because the coach has to call a play. They weren't prepared. You know, they're on the sidelines. I mean, you see that. Um, it, like if, if I'm scouting Jack Cohn, he doesn't like to throw the ball to his left. So like this isn't whether it's conservative or not, but like maybe call plays that, that fit the the quarterback better the tempo was great and so that was that wasn't really conservative that was like sort of an attacking style thing to do um but you've got a limited quarterback at the same time in terms of arm strength so it's not like we're not going to call these chunk play 60 yard bombs so i think at this point to answer the question going through the trials and tribulations what we had mike with the offensive line just to get a consistent passing game going even if it's just short game, quick game, we'll take it at that point. So hopefully we can evolve off of that if the uh, goal line is starting to shore itself up like it seems to, to yeah. be. Yeah, we haven't touched on the offensive line. Joe Wall, Andrew Gustafic start at left and left tackle and, and left guard respectively. I mean, best running game of the season. Notre Dame Surely. averaged over four yards per carry, and I don't have to give the caveat of uh, – you know, uh, sack adjusted rushing yards, just 4.1. You see it on the screen. So, um, thoughts on the offensive line rushing game. Yeah, there was some, there was, there was progress. It was like in the previous weeks, folks, like you had to really like get out that micro, micro microscope or micro magnifying glass and try and really look for some progress. And this week it was more apparent, um, with that asterisk of they played against a lot of three man fronts. So that lends itself to just more mobility, more movement rather, because it's just, you have more doubles. Um, and obviously it helps you in the pass pro game. So the left side of the line seems to be short up again, what Joe Walt's doing to me, even for him, Mike, to be able to like maintain that weight gain is impressive yeah. to be a full-time starter getting all those reps. And he's, He's he's keeping on the 40, 50, 60 pounds that he put on the last year. That's impressive. Um, I still think Caden Madden shouldn't be out there, but he is. Uh, but, yeah, it was defi definitely some progress in Kyron. If there isn't holes there, Kyron makes it happen on his own. Sure. Um, so the, 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 the running yard, the running yard yardage kind of total – a lot <laughs> that has to do more so with Kyron Mike than it does the O line play in general. Question from Ryan: Is it worth a loss or two if Buckner is to start from here on out? This is more of a just a philosophical thing. Like I, I, I could not That's imagine a great point. coach out there um, would say, "Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go nine and three instead of eleven and one." Just to you know, build for, for next year. Maybe if you're talking, you know, three and nine versus one and 11, maybe to build for next year. But I don't know, Mike, what do you think? This is something we talk about all of these shows. Like we talk about it after the first couple games. Like, would you rather go 10 and two or, with Cone or eight and four with Buckner? Well, I mean, this, we've been doing this hypothetical all year. 
We sure have. Uh, can't get enough of it. Um, What's going through your brain? Well, I, I see the wheels turn. Well, it's, it's the, I guess the, it's, it's the assumption Ryan asked the question, is it worth it a loss or two if Buckner becomes a starter? But then that's like, that's to say that if we lost the next two games, that Cone would no longer be our starter. So it's the assumption that Cone's not going to play because we lost games. So that's a weird kind of assumption there, right? Um, but I felt the same way. I mean, I was like, okay, once we lost to Cincinnati, I'm like, okay, maybe that gives us more room to kind of sprinkle sprinkle in Tyler. But if I would ask Ryan, if we don't lose a game or two and you do get to one of the bigger bowl games and or God forbid the playoff, uh, that's when you're really going to need Tyler. So it's the opposite of what we're thinking. Like, oh, let's lose a couple games so Tyler can play. Whereas I'm saying if we went out, you're going to need Tyler. <laughs> In those just those big time games, yeah. I think the question is, more... I promise you, Mike, we will go play, we will go play whatever, we'll go play Michigan in a bowl game, New Year's Six game, and we'll be getting our butts kicked. And then, like, what if we throw two picks? It's like, oh, Tyler should have been playing. It's like, okay, so you had Cone in there this whole time for what just to get there and get to get boat raced, and it's like. I could just see – I can literally see it happening. I could see it happening. I don't know against Michigan, but maybe if you're talking like an Alabama or – Okay, in Alabama, Georgia, not Georgia, Clemson this yeah. year. But, yeah, maybe an Ohio State type team. Yeah. I'll, I'll grant you that. Yeah, yeah. Michigan's improved. We actually have uh, – I'm, I'm sure you saw this comment. Mike says, I want Michigan – Kevin says, I want Michigan in a New Year's Six game. Want the 2019 game. Uh, bitter taste out of my mouth. Um, a couple questions here. Do you have any opinions on Michigan this season? I don't know if you watch them or follow their season. Um, so that's the first part of the question. Second, which who like it's a good question coming off a rivalry game. Who do you hate the most as a Notre Dame alum, former Notre Dame football player? Um, who are kind of your biggest, you know, rivals in your opinion for Notre Dame? Oh. I think we, I think you know again. Shout out to Lou. I think we talked about this once previously, but my my opinion, Boston College was like number one because we never, I never beat them in my time there, and they used to tear our field up um, after the games. So there's that. Michigan State, I felt like a rivalry. I felt like Purdue was a rivalry, and these are just kind of like Michigan State was a dirty team. USC is a rivalry, uh, and I think it's more of a. I had respect for USC just because of like the backstory, the lineage. Uh, you respect USC. I thought that they were a little bit disrespectful this weekend, just doing a couple extra bullshit, like, you know, kind of shoves and some things here, some kind of like late hits and all that, which naturally we didn't respond to. Um, Michigan's arrival. Uh, but yeah, my personal biggest rival would probably be Boston College, and I respected. I mean, we played we played USC back when they were good with Reggie Bush, Matt Leiner, you know, Lendell White spit in my face one time. What? You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Like and like and, and I couldn't do anything about it. Like, but I still remember that. Like, and I couldn't do anything about it because I'd got thrown out of a game. But that really happened. You yeah. Think, would have, you think you would have beat his ass? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, that was not uh, a good question so to throw yeah, you so, on the spot live on YouTube. <laughs> No, who knows, dude? Who knows? Um, but nobody likes to have their face spit in. Uh, I can assure you that. So, um, but yeah, in thoughts on Michigan, I was at the Michigan-Nebraska game. And Michigan's really well coached. I think that I would still probably give us the edge on a top to bottom level of talent. I would give us the edge. But uh, they've got a great like coaching staff. I think they've got some like NFL type guys on their staff and um, – I would. I think they would probably be, be be favored, but if we were a dog in that game, I would bet us to win. Okay. Okay. I I, I hope people don't pull the stones out uh, to to throw at me uh, when I ask you this question. Like I, the morning of the USC game, I posted on our bloomgold.com message board. Like for a Notre Dame fan, who like what are your biggest rivals? Same question I just asked you. I posted to Notre Dame fans, and it was Michigan was the most popular pick for the school they hated the most, but it was wide range i mean all sorts of different schools i feel like if you talk to an ohio state fan it's going to be very consistent with each ohio state fan a michigan fan 
They hate Ohio State, Michigan State. Like, I, do you think it's kind of like a not good thing for Notre Dame's brand that they don't have that one like true rival that Notre Dame's biggest rival is this school and this school's biggest rival is Notre Dame, like at a Michigan and Ohio State, a Duke, North Carolina. Um, I don't know. Is USC's biggest rival UCLA? Like, is it even Notre Dame? Uh, what do you think, Mike? I don't know if it hurts the brand, but you make a good point. Um, yeah, traditionally speaking, and this you know goes back to the new Rockney days, right? And the backstory behind how that game came to be played is kind of fun, and that just adds to the lure of the game. How about USC? But yeah, that's yeah, where his wife wanted to get out of the cold, so they take a train out there, and then they ended up. That's how the that's how the series got started was to get his wife out of the cold during the winter. But, uh, yeah, on paper, USC is the rivalry. I think fans have different experiences at different games. Like, all it takes, man, is, like, let's say we're on the road playing at Virginia Tech, and some Virginia Tech, like, dumps a, dumps a beer on one of our fans' heads or something like that. Like, all it's going to take is for that one fan to be like, man, I hate Virginia Tech because that one. And that's how it's more like for me as a player where it's like, you know, Michigan State was a filthy, dirty team to play against. It's like so. I hate you. I hate. Uh, I hate Michigan. You know, even though I got my face, I got spit on by a USC player, but I still had a level of respect for the guys that they had out there and just how dominant they were. It was like you had to give them their their due. Yeah, I just think about like majority of Notre Dame's fans' biggest rival team they hate the most is Michigan. If you ask a Michigan fan, it's it's Ohio State, Michigan State, then maybe Notre Dame, unless there's another big. Well, you'd have to. Team. You'd have to. You have to do some polling there, Mike, to say like, okay, follow up question to that survey is like, where are you all from? Where are you born and raised? So maybe it has to do with like a regional yeah. thing, whereas Michigan's closer than USC. Maybe it has to do with like, um, you know, I'm no academic, Mike, shocking to hear, I know, but I think that Michigan is a better school than, or USC is a better school than Michigan on paper, but maybe think Michigan close. thinks that they're. Yeah, they are close. So if we're going to say the USC's or excuse me, Notre Dame rather is the best academic institution and then USC would be below us and then Michigan would be even below USC. But I think that Michigan, there's a part of that fan base where there's like a little bit of elitism. I've heard of that before, um, where maybe Michigan fans think that they're academic. They're on the same status as Notre Dame from, from an act. I think that might blend into it too for the average fan, you know, a Notre Dame alum. And, and so I just I just look at it strictly from meathead perspective, Mike. <laughs> drunk, <laughs> it's all football. So. Drunk Vigo says, and and these fan bases spread out everywhere. That yeah, that's the great point. It's like the Southern California Notre Dame fan is going to hate USC the most. The Massachusetts Notre Dame fans probably going to hate Boston College the most. The former Notre Dame linebacker who lost to Boston College is going to hate Boston College the most. Uh, like Ohio State's fan base. I mean, I would say a good chunk of it's in the state of Ohio. Notre Dame's is is international, so certainly. There's a guy that there's a guy that goes to my gym, um, and he's clearly an Ohio State fan. Like Ohio State tattoo, Ohio State gear, like head to toe. Every single time I see him, and it's like, yeah, that's that's an Ohio State fan, yep. you know. Yeah, a couple comments here, John. Basically, my point there, you know, he, he's. If you're from SoCal like I am, then USC is our biggest rival. Uh, Ryan says he hates USC. Um, Michigan is 1B. So, Mr. Goolsby, any uh, closing thoughts here uh, before we uh, before we sign off? Anything else, whether it's about Notre Dame football, the season, what's going on in, in, in your life before we get out of here? I think, I think we're going to – it's, it's remarkable to look at all the freshmen that are playing and all the ups and downs that this team has had. I do think we're going to end up in a, in a premier post game, either be bowl or somehow the final four scenario. And as the way the team is currently comprised, I think for us to show well in that bowl game, Tyler Buckner needs to get more run. I just feel like you're going to need him in a big spot like that. I just, I really, truly do. The more I watch it. Um, and then, well, this is one other fun thing to talk about too, Mike. Cause we love these. What ifs. If 
Kyron came back next year, if Foskey came back next year, and Kyle Hamilton came back next year, and then you sprinkle in like a Prince Kali, um, you've got Mayer back. I think Kevin Austin comes back, right? I mean, that, folks, is like in new age college football, that is a national championship winning program because you've got a couple first rounders. Oh, and by the way, I also want to say with Tyler as your quarterback next year, that's a national championship team. I mean, if you talk about like if they don't lose anybody, like I think Jason Adam Alola could be gone. He's had a tremendous season. If Myron Tongue of Loa Mosa would come back, and then there's all sorts of guys that could take an extra year of COVID eligibility that. You know, like Jonathan Dwower, the kicker, and Kurt Heinisch took this year. Like, a lot of guys could could play an extra season. Yeah, I mean, the, there's a lot of talent. But, yeah, between Kyron, Hamilton, I mean. But they're there. I mean, I'm telling you, in terms of having bona fide studs at a lot of different levels on your team. Yeah. Like, you maybe have a first-round draft pick in our center in Patterson. Yeah. You may have a first-round draft pick in our tailback. You've got a first round draft pick at tight end. You got a first round draft pick at defensive end. You have multiple NFL guys on your defensive front. You have a first round top. And these, I mean, these are top. Foskey Hamilton are top 10 type player guys. And it's like, that's now we have an Alabama. I mean, that, now we have a makeup like an Alabama in terms of the stud level. Would, would Notre Dame have a first round quarterback in the future with Buckner? Poof. Dude, early declarations, Mike. You're gonna make a bold statement. Mike, here. Mike, Mike. On this podcast, I will never say first round and Notre Dame quarterback in the same sentence ever again. I don't think. <laughs> so that's that's way too early to tell. But I just feel like a lot of the elements that Tyler has in his game, the escapability, the live release, the being able to throw on the run, that is modern day football. Yeah. Unless you're Tom Brady, but he's you know. 61 years old so you Buckner you have to feel the most excited about Buckner at the quarterback position for Notre Dame since I mean uh, Jerkovic would come to mind but I would say someone like you've seen like Jerkovic was just based off high school and accolades he had uh, I mean you, you you I mean Buckner's got the highest ceiling of a quarterback that you've seen actually playing a game I don't think Jerkovic just got garbage time since when Kaiser, maybe if someone felt that highly about book going into senior season, maybe, I mean, the, the ceiling's just enormous for, for Buckner. I, again, personally, if someone was slamming me about my Buckner comments and I'm a Buckner hater. Like, I just don't think he's super ready to lead the offense right now. Just my personal but no, opinion. I, and nobody's, nobody's saying that I'm not saying that, but how do you get somebody? It's like, again, I'm in sales for a living, right? So when you're first on getting underway, it's like, well, everybody's looking for three to five years of sales experience to get a decent sales job. It's like, well, how the hell do I get that experience? You got to give them that. So those balls that he floated against Virginia Tech, he gets to do that three, four, five, six times in a game and his nervous system calms down and he's able to complete that pass. Like the ability is there. And I'm just saying, like, I've yet to meet Tyler Buckner. I hope to one day, but he just seems Mike, like one of those. We talked about this, like he might see, be like an exceptional kid. Yes, I feel like he's an exceptional kid. I just, I bet you, he's a straight A student. Yep, um, calm, cool, just like it too. It, yeah, and he's uh, so I just feel like why not give a, a kid like that more run and just live with the live with a couple mistakes here because your team, the surrounding cast around him, is good enough to win most games. Like this game, we didn't do anything remarkable this game when we won it pretty handily. So, I mean, we could have, we could have sustained a, another turnover this, this week um, in exchange for continued development of Tyler. So we'll see. Well, we are at 59 minutes, 10 seconds. So we are going to sign off Notre Dame's at uh, what is that? Seven and one, seven and one. What a, uh, who would have six thought and six and one. What a, it's a crazy season for six and one. Notre Dame is home against North Carolina. Looks like Virginia is their biggest kind of test the rest of the season, but Navy just played Cincinnati tough. I mean, who knows what North Carolina can do offensively. Um, you got to go at Stanford. Uh, so going to be an interesting um, finish down this stretch here. But I'm Mike Singer. He's Mike Goolsby. We are signing off. Appreciate everyone. We will catch you next time.